peculiar world that we live in. nature of our, what we call our existence, our life, our being, is awareness, is consciousness. And consciousness is itself just a form of energy, like a light. It appears to us as a light, it becomes a light. When we see that purified consciousness, purified awareness, And even though that light is so close to us, it's just, just there, just like a turn of the head, just in the corner of the eye, you can catch a glimpse. And yet, it seems to be so foreign. It's like a myth. We have, we have these like stories of like angels or beings of light or something like that. We think it's something that's very exotic, very unusual. Kind of mystical, the stories of the uh, kind of the, the, the kind of weirdo ex mystics and so on that they, they tell these stories about encounters with the light. But that light which they talk about is nothing different from the light with which we see anything, the light with which we know anything. So as we're sitting here, each one of you has this light inside you. Don't say, not me, I've only got darkness, <laughs> I've got a black soul. It's right there. It's actually glowing inside of you like a beacon. There's a very beautiful uh, dialogue in the uh, um, Priharanika Upanishad, the Brahmanical scripture, and one of my favorite ones where this uh, um, sage, this rishi, Yajnavalkya, had previously made a deal with the king, Janaka, that he would answer whatever the king asked him. He said, ask me whatever you want, I'll answer you, I will tell you. So one time, sometime later, the king wanted to question him, but on that day, Yajnavalki was feeling like being quiet. He didn't want to engage. So the king came to him and said, I wish to ask you these questions. And Yajnavalki said, I'd rather not, thanks. The king said, but you promised. And then he said, the king said, what is, it, what is, what is a person's light? What is the light of oneself? And Yajin Valkyar answered, the sun. Because it's by the light of the sun that one can walk around, one can see what's happening, one can see the cows, the trees, other people. 
and do one's business during the day. And King Janaka said, Sadhu, Sadhu, Sadhu. That's a wonderful answer, O great sage. But, he said, in the evening time the sun goes down. The night time draws its veil. What then is the light of oneself? Yajin Valky said, it's the moon, great king. Because when the moon comes out, you can see. The king said, Sadhu, 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 Yajna Valkyo. That's a very profound answer. You are indeed the great sage. But, he said, sometimes there's no moon. What then is a person's light? And Arjuna Valky said, when there's no moon and there's no sun at that time, the stars are a per person's light. Because by starlight one can uh, see one's way along a path at night time. And the king said, Sadhu, 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 Arjuna Valky. That's a very profound answer. But sometimes the clouds are thick at the night time. There's no sun, there's no moon, there's no stars. What then is a person's light? And Yajnavalki said, O great king, at that time when the sun has set, when there is no moon, and when the clouds are thickly obscuring the stars, at that time, a torch <laughs> is a person's light. <laughs> One of those LED torches. We actually saw that just the other day. We are doing a class at the monastery, and we noticed we were looking at the uh, history of the Indus Valley Civilization. 3000 BC and there was a distinct sculpture of a man with an LED headlamp on we saw with a headband and so on so they obviously had very advanced technologies then so a torch is a man's light and the king said sadhu 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 that's wonderful Yajnivalkya that's a very profound answer but he said sometimes the sun has gone down there is no moon the clouds obscuring the stars and the batteries have run out in your torch what then <laughs> is one's light and Yajin Valky said a great king when the sun has gone down when there is no moon when the clouds obscure the stars when one has no torch at that time One's self is one's light. One's self is one's light. So finally, the king managed to chase Yajnivalkya into telling the truth. And it's a very beautiful dialogue because the end of the search is the thing which is most apparent from the beginning. The question is, you know, what, what is one's own light? Yeah? And we've all gone all around the world and the cosmos to come back and saying, well, you're, you're your own light. The, the light is in here. And we've gone on that whole search, everything in the universe we've been through, to come back here and to say, the light is inside. The light is inside. Elsewhere, in another dialogue, Yajna Valkya said that, that, that what, what he calls a self was in fact consciousness, vijjana ghanameva, the sheer mass of consciousness. So when he said one's self is one's light, he meant that one's consciousness is one's light. The Buddha used exactly the same phrasing, whether or not he was referring to that or knew of that particular dialogue, it's not sure, but he, he, he said very famously that, that, that one's self... It's, a bit, it's also a bit uh, ambiguous in Pali. Let oneself, be, let oneself be a light to oneself. But it can be translated the word deeper in Pali. It means either light or an island. So it can mean let oneself be one's own refuge. Or it can be let oneself be one's own light. It can work in either way. So this is one of the, uh, the affirmations uh, of Buddhism and Buddhism says that it's in your nature to experience these things it's not something which is bestowed by the by the by the unaccountable 
uh, and inscrutable grace of some higher power. The light that you experience in your meditation, the light which illuminates your consciousness and your awareness, the light by which you can see anything, by which you can know anything, that is who you are. When we practice meditation, that practice is a practice of reflection. The Buddha, in, a, in quite a literal sense, the Buddha said, what's a mirror for? A mirror is for reflecting. And so that's used for reflecting in a, in a very ordinary, everyday sense, like say, the, the sutta passage that we, uh, we read just now. One reflects on one's speech. Is this the right time to speak or the wrong time to speak? Is this speaking out of anger or out of kindness? Is it speaking from a place of wisdom or from a place of, of ignorance? These kind of ways of reflecting. Is it gentle? Is it harsh? This reflection, this process of reflection, just in, an, in the ordinary way we use reflection in English. And that itself, that itself is not different from the light that we experience in meditation. Because it's already, even at that simple level, it's already a turning back into oneself. Even that very simple level, like when the Buddha said, you know, what is a mirror used for? Actually, he was asking his son, Rahula, who was only a child at the time. Yeah, it's a teaching for children. What's a mirror for? It's for reflecting. It's for looking back at yourself. So that simple child's teaching is containing the seeds or containing the, 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 the essence of that very profound nature of our own awareness, which is to be reflexive. Uh, uh, the nature of our consciousness, of our awareness, is always to, to cycle back, to reflect back, to, to inquire back, to look back upon itself. And in the process of meditation, that uh, is honed to a very fine degree. We reflect back, we look into our body, like we were doing in the meditation before, looking into the bones, skeleton, the solid stuff, hard bits of matter, We've all seen them. We know what skeletons are like. If you don't want to know what if you don't know what skeletons are like, come and see me afterwards. We've got one sitting in a box in here. Okay. <laughs> you know what does it feel like when 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 it's not there? This is one of the ways that you can tell what does a skeleton feel like. It was, I never knew this until I'd done meditation. I never knew that you actually feel your skeleton. You go, you go, you go kind of a whole life and you never actually, yeah, this, this thing lives inside of me and I've never actually felt it. And you realize that actually it defines or it was one of the things that defines how you, how, how you experience the world. You experience the world you, that that the, you know that hardness, that shape that the skeleton gives you. If if you, the skeleton was out, you just flobble down on the floor in like a jellyfish. And so our, our our very experience of the world, in any way, is dependent on our skeleton. And yet we we hardly ever reflect on that. We never we never even look at that or know what that is like. 
But when we do do that, we turn our experience to look in. We look at the skeleton, we look at the color, the shape, the size, the place. Now, that experience can, can go a number of ways. Sometimes it's just very mundane, nothing much to it. You just sort of put your attention on those things. Oh, yeah, that's what it's like. And there's not, you know, it's not particularly clear or particularly exciting, but just, just getting a bit of familiarity. So sometimes it's like that. Sometimes maybe you get some kind of reaction. Yeah, that that when you pay attention to your skeleton or something like that, it has it has like an emotional kick. Maybe maybe you've got some kind of of kind of emotional tension or, or something uh, which is which is triggered by that. So you get some kind of emotional fear or whatever it may be from that. Sometimes it will. Uh, Sometimes that reflective capacity starts to kick in and the, the bones in the skeleton will actually start to feed back. And this is where things start to get interesting. Where you're actually watching, you're looking at the skeleton, you're looking at, say, a bone, say, just a bone in my finger. I'm watching that bone, watching, 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 and then suddenly it starts to glow. It's almost like it's become luminescent. Of, I mean, living next to a nuclear power station or something like that, bones starting to glow. You look, you might, you see. And maybe, maybe some, often, often it might be one particular part starts to glow and others don't. You know, so one particular thing. So if that happens, just stay there, right? So if you find that you're doing that meditation, one particular bone or, or something starts to glow, it starts to feed back. Just stay, stay with that spot, yeah, and just keep on paying attention to there. And that can actually become a very beautiful and very deep uh, meditation just by itself. And if that makes a powerful impression, you can then uh, come back to that. Next time you come to do that meditation, you can come back to the same spot, pay attention to the same bone. And it may be because of that power of conditioning that uh, that, that, that will start to happen again. Now when that starts to happen, you can then use that, hold that in your mind very still, clear watching that and then use that as a basis for developing samadhi. You can actually find, uh, get into jhana or samadhi from that basis. Another way of doing it is by uh, more actively or more discursively investigating the body. For example, you can try uh, get a clear idea of the bones in the body and then just try removing them one by one. Taking them out one by one and putting them in a pile next to you. Just very patiently, one by one, take them out, put them in a pile. Feel what it's like to have emptiness instead, and then put them back again, one by one. So these kinds of meditations are, are uh, um, different ways that meditators use to, to play with uh, their own inner experience and to get more familiar with their own inner experiences, embodied consciousness, embodied awareness. And the more you do that, the great advantage of these practices is that you feel or you, you um, become at one with yourself, with your body, with your mind, at a very deep level. Here I am. Our, uh, our experience, our life, as we go from, from minute to minute, hour to hour, day to day, is made up of all of these kind of all of these particular unrepeatable experiences as we're all sitting here we're all experiencing something which is not exactly like anything we've ever experienced before what we see 
what we hear, what we feel in our bodies, the moods that we have, the thoughts that we're having. This combination of these things is absolutely unique. It's never happened before, it never will happen again. And the practice of, of contentment in Buddhism, the practice of, of being at peace, means being just happy with what is, just happy with this moment, this unique moment, as unsatisfactory as it may be. This moment here in this body, we're sitting here. We can't escape this by trying to run off to another moment. We can't escape this by running into the past. I heard a story once of a legal case in, in the States where it was one of these, somebody told me about it, it was one of these kind of American TV program, legal program things, but one of the real, real, real life ones. And apparently this, this woman was taking her doctor to court, suing her doctor, because she wanted the doctor to give her drugs to put her to sleep constantly or almost all the day. Because she had a, a dream lover who used to come to her in her sleep and she had a family and a life. And in her real life she didn't have those things. In her real life she was alone and she didn't have friends and she didn't have family. And she was very sad. But when she slept and she dreamt, she had all those things. So she wanted a doctor to give her some medicines, some drugs, so that she would just sleep all the time. And spend the time with her, her husband and her family. The doctor wouldn't give her the drugs, and so she took him to court. <laughs> Being in America. And uh, the... Uh, <coughs> But, you know, you've got to think, well, it's, you know, why shouldn't she just sleep if she's what she wants to do? She's not hurting anybody. Yeah? I mean, in a sense, we, we kind of feel, in a sense, there's, there's a deep wrongness to it. But it's not hard to say, it's not easy to say exactly why it's wrong. I mean, it certainly it's better than a lot of things a lot of other people do. So they had the court case, and you know, in, the, in, the, in the kind of the discussion, the lawyers are asking, well, you know, do you, know, do you always have, does your husband always come to you in your dreams? You know, do you always have these lovely dreams of your family and so on? She said, well, no, not all the time. Sometimes they have bad dreams as well. So even in that dream world is there's some, there's, uh, uh, it's not something we can escape to. Even, uh, even if we could escape to our dreams, we couldn't do that. I remember that was a very nice moment in uh, when I was a kid. I used to my favourite books, apart from the Lord of the Rings, was the Narnia books, and one of the Narnia books was the the Voyage of the Dawn Treader. And one of the uh, um, places that they went to on this voyage on this boat was the Island of Dreams. Yeah, and they get to the island and, high, and they meet somebody who's just come from the Island of Dreams, and he says, it's, "You've got to turn back. So they're in the ship." Yeah, if you keep on sailing, you'll reach the island of dreams. And all the sailors are like, oh, fantastic. All our dreams will come true. He's saying, yes, all your dreams will come true. Your actual dreams. Yeah? <laughs> your real dreams, they will all come true on that island. And as the more they began to think about it, the more they began to realize we've got to get out of here. Yeah? Actual dreams. So that's like an extreme example 
but it's it's a very good illustration of of just that ordinary tendency to want to get out of this reality, out of these skin and bones. Somehow we feel that that's not that there's something better. We feel that somewhere else, some other time, some other place, some other way of being is going to be better than this. But this is the, the secret, this is the trick. Like that search of Vyajan Valkya, like that, 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 that cycle of questions which the king was asking. When we go all around the universe, all around the cosmos, the cosmos itself is circling, the solar system is circling, the galaxies are spinning. Everything's spinning around. And our questions, our search for truth, for meaning, for happiness, our searches are always spinning around as well. We head off in one direction and we come back into another direction. We come back to it, we, we sneak up on a destination that's so far from what we thought. And even though we travel all around, the sun, the moon, the stars, we come back to ourself. The one who knows those things. This is what happened in quantum physics. They travel all the way down to the smallest particles in the world and then you realize that it's dependent on the observer. Do you find you're looking back upon yourself? And the secret is that that's where the actual happiness is to be found. The more clear-eyed, the more steady, the more content, the more honest that we are in looking at ourselves, the more we can pierce through those darknesses and see that true light that is within. And that search for that light of awareness is actually aided by the absence of all those other lights. Because the light of the sun, the moon, the stars, the lamps, they're a distraction. We turn all those other lights off, we look inside. And then little bit by little bit, in a way it's very shy, very... Um, uh, almost like, like a wild animal. That light will gradually start to creep up inside ourselves. And that's who we are at a very deep level. We are that awareness. Not at the deepest level. We haven't got down to the deepest level yet. But still, at a very deep level, we are that awareness, we are that light. At the deepest level of insight, we'll let go of that light itself. And the Buddha said that Nibbana is a place where there is no light. There's no light shining there. It's too subtle for light. But, but that finding that, finding that experience of that light, which we call, sometimes we call a nimitta, or, or the, the, uh, the sign of meditation or something like that, the radiant mind, different words that people use for that. They're just words. We don't make a big deal about the words. But this will reveal to us who we take ourselves to be. Where is our sense of me, of mine, of I am? Where is that abiding? Where is that seeking refuge? Where is that escaping to? 
It's like Yajna Valkya was escaping from Janaka's questions and his, his, his self, the light of his self, was hiding, was escaping in ever more subtle forms. And in that light we'll finally see that. So this is something which I think is a very um, uh, inspiring reminder for us because in our spiritual practice we will all experience the darkness. They call it the dark night of the soul. And sometimes it seems that the darkness is the reality. It seems to be so powerful. It seems to have so much um, substance to it. it. Presses us down, constricts and compresses our heart. It stops us from loving. Cuts us off from feeling. It undermines our sense of self. And it 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 um it paralyzes our capacity to be and to live. But even then, even when the darkness is very thick, even in that night, as Yajna Valkya said, when there's no sun, no moon, no stars, no lamps, in the thick darkness of the night, even then, that light inside oneself actually is just there. Just a little bit of a, just, just turning the attention a little bit and there it is. And if we can learn that, if we can have faith in that, then even in that darkest night, we won't despair. We can still feel the depression, the sadness, the misery but that will come into us, it will stay with us, and it will pass through us. But we won't reach that stage of despair because we know that there is that something else. So this is my little talk for you this evening on uh, the body in meditation and on the light of meditation. So I offer this to you for your Reflection, and I'd like to invite any comments or questions.